Heavenly Father, I pray that you will give us fresh and brand new manna, that we can walk in newness of life. Lord, we always pray every Sunday that we, we want fresh food, fresh ideas from heaven, fresh inspiration, fresh revelation, so that we can walk better this week than last week. We can walk better this month than last month. And there is progress because your word promises for those of us who are in you, we do go from glory to glory. And we don't want to stay in one state of glory, on one stage of glory, but we want to just keep moving on because, it's, because it is your purpose and your plan that we experience new glory in our life. We thank you for that promise. We pray that your word will change our mind this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible with you, go, go ahead and turn with me to Proverbs chapter 15. Actually, let's go to Proverbs chapter 11 first. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 13. And then I'm going to jump to 15, verse 22. It says pretty much the same thing, but I just want to emphasize it. So there, there are some scriptures up here. You know, this is the coldest day of the year so far, yes? You know what happened to my house? My heater broke down <laughs> last night. Unbelievable. And so, you know, a curious cat like I am, I always want to figure out how to fix it, right? So I, uh, I, I, I stayed up from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock trying to figure out how to fix my furnace without killing myself. You see, it's gas furnace, and you don't want to place the bomb down, you know? <laughs> so anyway, so I, um, anyway, so I'm glad I'm alive. Did I fix it? No. <laughs> All for nothing, you know? But um, anyways, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 13, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I believe that's what you have on the screen, is he who goes, ab uh, sorry, That's not what I want. That's the problem with just sleeping late. <laughs> Hang on a second here. Let's go to 1522 first. We go to 1522 and then we go to 1114. Sorry. 1114. Okay, so... Um, so let's read 15. It says, without counsel, plans fail. But with many advisors, they succeed. I'll read it again. Without counsel, plans fail. But with many advisors, they succeed. Amen. Okay, let's go to Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14. It says, where there is no guidance, the people fall. But in abundance of counselors, there is victory. One more time. Where there is no guidance, the people fall. But in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Today, I want to talk about creating your board of directors in life. Your board of directors in life. Do you realize that every successful corporation, every successful organization, profitable or non-profitable, if they are to be successful, they usually would have a team of people not necessarily doing the work, but providing guidance and counsel for the corporation or the manager of the corporation or the organization so that they can mitigate risk, but most importantly, seize opportunities. No successful organization would be successful without a board of directors. Now, the board of directors that are being chosen to help guide the company are usually the people that have amazing experience in their industries. They are the champions of industries. And so, for example, you know, you look at a, a biggest bank of this country called the Royal Bank. 
the Royal Bank have board of directors with people that have a lot of experiences in government policies, a lot of experiences in foreign government policies, a lot of connection and experience in, uh, in, in marketplaces, you know, that they want to invest in. For example, for the people like, like Royal Bank again, you know, if they want to invest in an oil industry, they need to have an oil man or oil expert who had been championed in the industry to be sitting on their board so that they can know exactly how to invest the many billions of dollars they have in the reserve into a proper vehicle so that they can yield more profits. So each of the board of directors are champions in their own industries, have demonstrated themselves to be successful in what they were doing. And this board of directors are there. Their job mainly is to give advice so that the corporation can be successful. This is a very scriptural concept as we have just read. Because the Bible says that this kind of concept of having multitudes, board of directors, not just one or two, but multitudes, multitudes of advice will bring safety, will bring success, will bring victory in our lives. You see, it is the plan of God that we all succeed. I tell you this, if you read Psalms chapter 139, when you have an opportunity to read, in fact, you know, maybe we can go to it. Well, let's go to it. You know, Psalm 139, the Bible actually speaks of how it is the intention of God. Actually, we're not going to have time to read it, so I'm just going to go quickly on this one. So in Psalm 139, you're going to read that God in his plan said that he had written our days in his book. Each and every day of our lives is already written in the book. Did you know that? Did you know that your life is written in a book? Every day of your life is being written out already, even before you were formed. So God has this specific book that he had written out for our days on earth. How many of you know that our God is not one of those novel writers that write bad endings? You know, I, you know, one of the things that get me really upset watching all those Academy Award winning films, those Academy Award winning films, many of them are very, uh, have very sad ending because they're very dramatic and they make you think about it all the time because you're so upset about it, you know, and then, you know, all kinds of sad ending surprises, you know. I hate, re I hate watching movies that have sad endings. I know movie, you know, people say you want to make movies realistic. Seriously, if I want realistic, I just live life. That's realistic. That's reality enough. But if I actually want to be entertained, I want to be entertained and have a happy ending so that I'm happy, right? So anyways, I mean, that's just me. You know that people have more sophisticated, well, you know, have a more sophisticated way of, of being entertained. You know, they want sophisticated uh, movies so that they can have a sophisticated emotional experience, you know, i.e. being sad, you know. But I'm a simple guy, you know. I'm not like a child. I, I just like those, you know, Iron Man, you know, you know, he wins, you know, at the end, and, and then Avengers, you know, and, and they all win at the end, and good guys win, bad guys lose, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but our God is a God who writes good things about you and about me. My God is interested in your success because he had written a book about it for your success. There is a blueprint for you before you were even born that you will become great and awesome. The Bible also tells us that he had created us in his own image. You know, the image of God is not flawed. The image of God is not failure. It's true that when sin entered into the world, when Adam and Eve, you know, made the decision to, to not walk in the purpose of God anymore, it's true that they fell short of the glory of God and that those, those plan of God for human beings were disrupted. But when Jesus came and died on the cross 2,000 years ago, the Bible said that on that cross, he had made you, you, every single one of you, 
you and me the righteousness of God. You say, but pastor, you know, I, I still mess up, I still sin. It's true, we still make mistakes in our life, but that's what grace comes in, is that regardless of what you have done, regardless of what you have, uh, what, what you have uh, committed in the past, in his grace, he had made you his righteousness. So you are the righteousness of God, and through Jesus, you are the perfect image that God had intended you to be in Christ Jesus. There is something to be celebrated about. And because of that, you are not, you do not have the image of failures. You have an image of success that he had created to fulfill his purpose on this planet Earth. Now, he is not a God that created robots. One of the greatest gifts he had given us as human being is a gift of freedom, a gift to make choices. He hadn't called us to be robots, but he called us to be intelligent beings to make good decisions. Now watch this. Because he given us the ability to make choices, he is also very aware that we may make wrong choices. Because of that, he had given us tools at our disposal so that we can make perfect and right choices. And one of those tools is what we call people. In this context, the board of directors of your life. You know that none of us are designed to walk this life out alone. None. None of us are designed to live this, out, this, this life out being alone in an island. You are not designed for that. And if you're trying to live like that, life is miserable. But God had designed so that he, you, you can have a group of people, like-minded people, who has your best interest in their heart to surround you and to cause you to make the right decisions. And so I call this group of people your board of directors. And when you find yourself in a community of believers like in this place, there is an opportunity to gather to yourself a group of people that will give you the right advice and to have to pray with you, to cause you to walk in the ways that will cause you to walk in your, in your full destiny. You know, not all advisors are good advisors. You need to be selective. Everybody says selective. selective. You need to be very selective in who you pick to be your advisors. In other words, you need to be selective of who would speak into your life. That is not to say that you're not going to love everyone. You see, in the house of God, in the kingdom of God, we are taught to love one another, to reach out to those who are not reachable, to love those who are not lovely, the people that annoy you, the people that cause, yeah, just make you mad, the people may smell or whatever, didn't brush your teeth or whatever. We are to love them. The people that may not be from your culture, speak your language, you may not understand the food, it, but nonetheless, you love them also. That's the love of God. That's the unconditional love that God had placed upon your heart and my heart. By the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, you know, that's the love. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about surrounding yourself with people that will speak into your life to cause you to go further, to go higher, to increase your uh, your territories, these are the people that God had called, uh, had uh, had designed to put in place for us. We just need to ask the Lord to give us wisdom, so that we can identify who they are. Sometimes they may not be the people closest to you. With all the good intention that they may have. Sometimes, because of so many things they know about you, they may not give you the right advice. Let me give you an example. You know, when I was younger, I had wanted to become a pastor. 
And because I felt called to be a pastor. And so I've always think about how I can serve the Lord. And I know that it is the will of God that I become a minister. Now, there are other opportunities, you know, for me to be in business, and which is what I was in. I was working in a, in a corporate world you know, as a manager and enjoy it, make good money. But I always knew that I wanted to be a pastor. You know, but some of my family members that were closest to me did not want me to be a pastor. Because they had experienced themselves how hard it is to be a pastor. So with the true love they have for me, they said, no, 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 no. Don't go into that industry. <laughs> it's really not an industry. But don't go into that profession because you're going to be poor forever. And because they were poor forever, they didn't want me to be poor forever. And because they loved me, they tried to encourage me not to become a pastor. And so here I was, you know, like trying to fight off this advice. And, you know, they would give suggestion, you know. One of them would give me a suggestion. Why don't you wait until you pass the prime of your earning season? You know, make the money you make right now. And then just after that, when you retire, have nothing else to do, you know, you go and serve the Lord. Now, we've, they, they have great intention in their hearts. I mean, they think like most Christian think is that when I retire and have money, then I'll serve God. When I'm financially independent, I'll serve God. And it's good intention to have in their heart, and God bless them. But I want to tell you, they may not be the best decision or advice for me. So although we were close, we knew each other all our lives, some of them, but they were not able to give me the best advice. I had to pray and ask the Lord, to give me the board of directors that I need. You know, some of them board of directors, you know, I have learned, may not necessarily even know me. It's just I allow those people to speak into my life. There will be the people sometimes I find that the public speakers, you know, or the books that I read, you know. But I do surround myself with a few individuals that really... Believe what I believe. Believe that we can do better. Believe that God can call me to greatness. Believe that I have a great destiny. And they will not come and discourage me when I'm down. But they will say, try it again. Come on, rise up and try again. They are not those individuals who say to me, oh, don't worry about it, you know. This is not for you, you know. This is too hard. Just give it up already. But they were individuals that say, don't give up. Try harder. You know, we're praying for you believing in God for you, I could see that you, you could would be very successful in reaching the lost and preaching the good news and, and, and helping people and help transform lives. And you know, those are the people that really, when I was in the place of discouragement, they will be able to lift me up. But most importantly, they are able to give me advices to navigate through life. You see, we human beings are a bunch of emotional people. Are we not? We often make a decision based on how we feel. And so if you are not, if you're not objective enough, which most of us are not when we are in this emotional twilight zone, you know, as I call it. You know, you, you make decisions that you would regret in life later on. And you would take chances and take risks unnecessarily. And so what you do is you, you just make decisions. But... Those people whom I call it your board of directors, your brothers and sisters that actually have your best interests in mind, they will be able to help you to make decision outside your emotion. And I want to tell you this, is that when you want to pick a board of directors, pick those that have proven to have heard from God. I'll say it again. Pick those that you know they have heard from the Lord. You know the Bible says, you know how you test the prophets? You test the prophets by seeing whatever they say if they had come to pass. If people say things that had never come to pass, you want to stay away from them. You know, it's the people that had not proven themselves to you of what they say, what, that what they say is going to happen or their advice have been proven to be sound, you stay away from them. 
you, you don't hate them, you don't dislike them, you love them. But on the other hand, the people that have proven themselves in life, the older people, don't mind taking advice from them. I know young people in this generation, in this day and age, you know, we always think that we are the next thing, next, we are with the future, and so the, the previous generation have no idea what they're talking about. They just don't so, know so little. We have experienced more. We know more this day because of the digital age, and the people that are older, they know nothing. But I want to tell you this. The older people, they got tons of deposits in them that you can draw it out from them. If I were you, I would go and look for some of the older people, not all older people, but the older people that have proven themselves in life and begin to draw from them, draw from them. Because the Bible teaches us that if you surround yourself with all those people, three things will happen. Number one, safety. Number two, success. Number three, victory. Amen. That's what the Bible says. And you are designed to have success and victory and safety. Some versions say that you'll be established. Why is that, why does that mean? It means that you are established so well that you are safe. This is an amazing season of shifts. There are people, if they have an open mind, they will see that this season that we're entering in, whether it's in church, where it is outside the church, they will see that a lot of shifts are going on. And when you have multitude of counsel, you don't have to be afraid of the changes that are happening. Because this multitude of counsels, if they're any good, they will tell you, they will be able to see the opportunity for you to go and seize so that you can actually become what God had called you to be. When you don't have multitude of counselors and advisors, there is no safety. You always would second guess yourself. You look at all the changes that are going on, you get afraid. You are scared. You say, oh my goodness, look at the changing economy. You know, I was, I was actually listening to, uh, to, uh, to a politician the other day, um, not in Canada, so, so you don't know what my preference is. I was listening to a politician, you know, and uh, um, so this politician, he was telling, you know, um, uh, actually it's a she, she was telling uh, her audience, you're probably going to guess who I'm saying now, and she said, I am against this trans-Pacific trade, T Whatever. You know, the negotiating huge trade negotiation going on among 14 nations between America, Canada, Brazil, not Brazil, uh, Mexico, and all the, you know, Australia, New Zealand, and, and uh, 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 Japan, and all the Asian countries. It's supposed to be the biggest trading block of the world with 40% of the population in the trading blocks. It's a huge opportunity. And so this latest senior politicians basically say, you know, I am against. This. So she was actually repeating some of the lines that a lot of people have said, you know, because of the trade agreement we had had in the past, you know, we lost all the good jobs, good manufacturing jobs and good paying jobs, and now they all go to somewhere else. And many people actually believe that, and it is true that many good paying jobs had disappeared. But what they didn't tell us is that in this new economy, there are a lot of good paying jobs also being created. Now watch this. For the people able to observe, for the ones that can see, you will see that our economy had shifted from labor-intensive job, which means you work and work physically, shifts, whatever, had shifted over to a service economy, which means that we use our brain, we got to sit in the office with AC while there's heat, you know, hot air all over in the summer. You know, we, gotta, you know, we, can, we can go and have a coffee break, you know, and, and you know, we may not have union, but man, we can have corporate lunch, you know. There's a lot of new opportunities, new jobs, new uh, uh, different services type of jobs that had opened up for many, many young people so that they don't have to work in this assembly line, which is nothing wrong with that. It's just that there is an economy that has shifted for the people that could observe it. 
They jump at the opportunity and they seize the opportunity and they become successful. But for the people who are walking in fear, when they see shifts are happening, what happened? They are afraid. They curled up. They say, no, 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 I don't want to go there. But you know, the world is moving by the second. Whether you want to go along with it or you just want to stay stationary. You know, if you ask some of the older people, they'll tell you that the world is moving very quickly. So you can move together with it in safety or you can stand on the sideline in fear. The Bible says we're no longer a slave of fear because we're a child of God. And one of the reasons is because God had provided us multitudes of brothers and sisters that we can ask to help us in our walk in life. And so instead of living in fear, all of a sudden you have this multitude of advisors that you can trust, that they are, they are gunning for your best interest, and you can feel safe. And when you feel safe, guess what happened? Your eyes will open up. You will see opportunities that you wouldn't see when you're in fear. See, when you're in fear, you always would be very cautious and suspicious of everything that comes your way. Especially when good things come your way. You will go, oh, I'm not that good for it. But if you have multitude of counselors that will tell you, you are good for it. You are good enough for it. I believe you can do it. You can go for it. It gives you courage. It gives you strength to go for the opportunity. You know, when I was young, I graduated from university. Um, you know, uh, being that I was born in a preacher's home, and so, you know, my, my dear mother loves me a lot. I shouldn't use her as an example. Sorry, Mom. She's not here this morning, so I can use her for example. And uh, she, she loves me so much. She wants to be so careful because in her life experience, you know, as many of us have, been cheated by people. They say if it is too good to be true, usually is too good to be true. Yes? So anyways, we were in a poor family, you know, living in a little apartment, you know. And um, at the time, there was, you know, I'm 47 years old. That was in my early 20s, so about 20 years ago, you know. And, uh, and uh, you know, a, a lot of us minorities still struggling to make it into the, into the society and so forth. So anyways, first year university, I found a job that pays me a lot of money in the summer. And the company was called Commodore. How many of you remember Commodore? None of you did. You weren't born yet. That was the first generation, very, very first generation for consumer for children. Anyways, so Commodore 64, you know, and then they just bought a company called Amiga. How many of you know Amiga? Never mind. Yeah, just two. Um, <laughs> just don't want to date ourselves, you know. But so, that, so that was this company called Amiga. And so they hired me as a marketing representative, you know. And uh, all I needed to do was to go around the dealers to demonstrate the product. So they do, what they do is they pay me really good. I never get paid that much so far in my life. And on top of that, every week, every beginning of the week, I get this envelope of cash, $500. That is for my meal. Like you work in a summer job, people are paying for your meal. Like they already pay you. And on top, they already pay you good money and they still pay you meals. They say, this is when you're on trips, you know, outside you can use it for your, for your meals. And it was exciting. And on top of that, they gave me the computer, the top of the line Amiga. I was so happy. I brought it home and all the software they had. That was amazing. I was carrying it up, you know. I moved into my little apartment, my little room, you know, setting it up and turning it up. So proud of myself. So my mom walked in. She said, where'd you get that? I said, well, it's from my work. She said, what kind of job would give you things like that? I said, this is my job, you know, I'm a marketing representative for Commodore and, and they, 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 they want me to represent. She said, this must be from some 
some no good company because no good company will pay a guy like you and give you all those stuff. <laughs> now, she loved me. She worried that I got messed up with the mafia or something like that, you see. Because of her experience. I don't, don't blame her because she loved me. She wanted to protect me like all the moms. See, if you're a mom, you look at your kids, all of a sudden become wildly successful. You go... Well, you always get C in your school. How did you ever come up with this job? Because I had C's in my, in my, in my growing up, you know. I mean, there's a family jokes about my marks, if you ask my sister. <laughs> so when I came home with this amazing job, of course it draws suspicion. So if I were to listen to her, I would go, you're right. Maybe this is a con artist job. So maybe I'll just return the computer, resign my job, and pay all the cash back. You see, sometimes when you are not in safety and you are in fear, you will push away even great opportunities that show up. We sing the song, we're no longer a slave of fear. And one of the reasons why we're not in fear anymore is because we would surround ourselves with counselors, with friends, and what I call the board of directors of your life. This board of directors that you pick will determine your life. Amen. Amen. And that's why, that's why it is so important that, you know, we don't succumb to the cultural push of our time. You see, in our culture in North America, is that we have become so individualistic, yes? And i tell you why we become so individualistic. The economy, the corporation, the, 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 the God of this world, I suppose you call it, had figured out a way how to tap and draw every ounce of energy that you have while you're working for them, for the hours they paid you. So that by the time you get home, you are completely exhausted. You want to have nothing to do with anybody. All you want to do is just to cook your meal and have, take care of your children and just do nothing. You want to call what they call vegged out. You want to be vegetables, thinking about nothing, don't want to care about nothing. What do you mean I want to go to fellowship and have some sort of relationship? I have no time for that. I'm too tired for that. This economy and the world system we're living in these days has figured out a way how to draw every ounce of energy out of us so that by the time we're done today, we are completely exhausted. We have no time for friends. We have no time for God. We have no time to develop this, this board of directors, we call it. We have no time to live a good life. We basically just sell our soul away for all this big corporation or whoever you work for. And so you're so exhausted. You have no time or energy for anything. But glory to God, we are part of not the culture of this world, not the culture of any country. We always say this, in this place, we are championing and pursuing the kingdom culture. And that culture tells us that we, amen, that culture tells us that we have to be smart. Not allowing the worldly system to sap every ounce of energy out of you. Am I preaching that you shouldn't be faithful? No, this is what I'm preaching. Be smart. Work smart. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the supernatural wisdom to accomplish the task that you need to accomplish without having your energy being sapped out. Another thing is this. Most of us may be having 80% of our energy expense by the time we finish work. But that 20% will actually completely exhausted by the time we reach home through commuting. I know it's very, very stressful to commute. My wife has to do that every day. She takes a car to the subway, to take a subway to a bus, and then to work. And then she repeats again backwards every day at the end of the day. Most of us live that life. So in commuting, we are exhausted. 
Not to mention all the crazies we see and they give us stress. Right? Crazies not only in subway, but crazies with the people driving. They're so unruly and they stress you out. I, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's driving this day is stressed out. Yesterday I was picking up my daughter. You know, going to, she has a sport program, you know, in the evening. So I, I was picking her up. So I was driving this Highway 14. I, I thought it's, it's clear, right? I mean, it's always clear. And all of a sudden, this train, there's this train track. So they closed it because the train was coming. And that train, you know, in the old days, choo-choo trains have five cars. <laughs> you remember that? But that train has a million cars. I was just sitting there, <laughs> you know, listening to music. You know, it's, just, it's like, oh, already finished already. It's like one after another, you know. It's like an Energizer bunny, you know, again and again and again. And one more cars and one more cars. And I look down, it's like there's no ending in sight, right? He stressed me out. And so by the time it finished, so I'm already a little bit stressed, right? It's like, oh. So I start driving. And then this guy behind me, it's not my fault. I'm in some. I, I'm behind somebody. This another truck in front of me. He was flashing the light, honky. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I understand this frustration, but don't put it on me. <laughs> it was honking and flashing light, and and finally we go into this two lane thing. And he drove beside me, and he had the audacity to give me the look. <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> What are you doing? So by the time I pick up my daughter, I was already half stressed. So, you know, and then, and then I got into the place anyways. That's, so I pick up my daughter. On my way back, another train. <laughs> so I was telling my daughter, look at this truck in front of me. He was in front of me when I came in and picked you up. Now he's in front of me again. And off it goes again. Oh, oh. <laughs> I tell you, the economy we live in these days, they are stressful. They sap us of all our energy. I pray that God will give us wisdom and a great grace to overcome stress. Because if you allow the driving stress to get to you, it will sap your energy, your strength. And if you allow them to do it so often, by the time you get home, you will have no energy, and so you will live your life alone on an island all the time. What a shame it is that we're not able to live the fullest that God had intended for us to live. In this church, because we believe the Bible, we believe that it is the intention of God, it is the plan of God, it is the purpose of God for us to succeed and live life to its fullest, not only in this lifetime, but in the next life to come. But God had called us to live life to the fullest. He had written a book about us and that He has created us to succeed and do well in life. We believe that with all our hearts. And He had also given us the tools so that we can succeed. But the enemy of our soul, the enemy of life itself will always be in a way to add distractions, to cause us to be stressed, to cause us to have our energy being drained out, to cause us to live as an island. And as you know, and I know, when you live in an island, there is great opportunity for you to get distressed, lonely, discouraged, depressed, and eventually be oppressed. Do you know in our society, there are many people are oppressed today? Many people are depressed and discouraged, despondent, sitting at home themselves. I was doing a, I was watching a documentary. It was saying that, I can't remember the percentage. There's a high percentage. Some of you may, can, can correct me. There's a high percentage of people that are living under depression. And nobody knows. Nobody knows when they're crying. Nobody knows when they're weeping. Nobody knows when they pour themselves over with wine every night. Nobody knows that they're popping pills. Because you know what? When we get out of the place, we all look just, when I get out of the house, we look just fine. We pretend to be fine. And yet so many are so broken. But God loves them all. 
And in his, in his perfect will, he wants to draw them out of the hole so that they can be in connection in places like that and be in fellowship and create good relationship and have good people to give them protection, safety, counsel, and victory. That's the God we serve. So from today onwards, I encourage you to do all that you can to look for someone who can be a great board of director or director, board of director for your board to lead you in the life that God wants to lead you. Godly people, people that believe in the most for you and believe in the best for you. People see that you can, the people who can see that you can go further than you are. Not those people that discourage you and mock you and put you down, but the people that will lift you up. That because you come, the worship team can come. Amen. Let's give praise to the Lord. So let's pray. Father, I ask this morning that the words that have been spoken will resonate in the hearts of men and women in this room. You have given us so much to bless us, to cause us, to ensure us to succeed in life. And one of those tools that you've given us are people. It's people that would that we can surround ourselves with, that will encourage us, lift us up, help us to mitigate risks, help us to seize opportunities, encourage us to go more than what we have been and do more than what we can, and encourage us to go further than we can ever possibly go on our own. And I pray that you open our eyes this morning to observe and see those people and invite them into our lives. Not only those that would have personal relationship with us, but also would cause us to listen to different men and women of God. They may be in distance, but, but had, had written great books or have preached great preaching that they can actually speak into our life to encourage us to walk out the best life you had purpose for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.